morning, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Ollie Whitehouse. I work for a small company in the UK called Rex. Um, and today's presentation is on finding the weak link in Windows binaries. Uh, what we're basically going to do is, is cover the what's, the why's, the how's, and go through some conclusions. But to help kind of influence where I'll take the talk, can I get a show of hands, please, on uh, those that work in providing security advice to others versus those that um, uh, try and provide assurance or security to their own company. So consultants first. Okay, so, okay, the majority internal, good. Okay. So um, the philosophy of Rex, uh, when, when we kind of look at problems, is really trying to make them scalable. So one of the challenges that we have in information security today is that, um, let's be honest, a lot of the tools and the products that are written need quite a, a deep level of security understanding to be able to maximize their effectiveness. Um, and so typically what we try and do is, instead of solving world hunger, is, is pick point-specific problems and make them um, accessible by non-security professionals. They may be, you, they may be used, used by security professionals as well, but the, the, that is not necessarily the intended goal. So when we're looking at what we're looking at with regards to uh, Windows binaries, um, this is basically the problem statement. So without debug symbols, being able to gain effectively a, a level of assurance that a binary does or does not use the maximum um, available defenses uh, to it. So what do those defenses kind of break down into? So we get the operating system provided defenses, so Windows Vista, Windows 7, with each new release comes a, a whole new suite or, or, or available defenses which typically require developers to opt in. Uh, compiler and tool chain uh, evolution, so stack cookies is a good example, um, but again, they require developers to turn them on, uh, so we want to be able to assess those binaries which aren't effectively utilizing those. Again, linker related, and then there are kind of actions that developers have to take. So be that um, kind of security enabling APIs that they can call, uh, or standard secure development lifecycle um, kind of best practice. So when we actually break that down into specific things, what we care about is the version and the compiler of the linker. If we can identify a binary that has been compiled with an older version of, say, Visual Studio, we know that its stack cookie implementation, for example, will not be as robust. Um, it may not actually have available to it, that compiler, um, certain protections which Microsoft introduced in later uh, releases. It may use the GCC tool set, which, again, will not have available to it the same level of defense necessarily as the Microsoft, Microsoft Visual C um, compiler suite. Then we have a number of uh, compiler and linker enabled protections. So opting in a binary saying is address space layout randomization enabled, that it does support non-executable memory, that it is using stack cookies, that it does use safe structured exception handling, etc. And then as I said, some of the kind of the, the more proactive APIs that developers can call. So uh, or telling the operating system that upon heap corruption detection to fail gracefully, so actually crash, while rather than try and struggle on. Um, you know, these features are available in the OS, but they require a developer to consciously think about the problem and, and make modifications to their code. And then the whole DLL executable planting problem and, and pointer encoding. So that's really what we're, what we're trying to look for. And then there are a number of others. So we have SDL band APIs. Microsoft, I guess, published that now what, five, six years ago, um, and, and you'll see that they're still very prevalent in their use. Uh, dangerous APIs, so this is some work that we've been doing, which is Microsoft has well-documented banned APIs under the SDL model, but they don't necessarily articulate small print about certain other commonly used APIs, so being able to identify their usage where they may undermine the other security features is, is important. Then we have, user, uh, we have the uh, UI separation and the integrity level mechanisms within uh, Windows, so identifying those binaries that have either elevated privileges within the context of the UI separation or run at a higher uh, integrity levels is obviously of interest. And then there are a number of other specific .NET traits. Um, so what I've discussed so far is primarily around, or is, is solely around unmanaged code. When we move into, manage la into the managed realm, we have a number of other um, properties which is useful to identify. So really, why do we want to do this? And, and this is, there, there's two, I'll cover both. So there's the defensive and the offensive um, argument, depending on which side of the fence that you're working. And obviously, naturally, everyone here is working on the defensive, but I'll cover the offensive anyway. 
Um, one of the biggest things is that a product is not a sole vendor. That is a reality. The, no company now that builds any product of any significant size writes 100% of the code. You know, it, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't scale and it's not economical. So, for example, Adobe Reader 10, and I don't pick on Adobe for any particular reason, it's literally like the first directory in my program files, so it's kind of, it's been the one that's had the most test cases run against it. But Adobe Reader 10 is actually, has components made by eight different um, suppliers or, or developers, and that may be open source or, com or commercial entities. So while we see these companies uh, come out with SDL rhetoric saying we adopt an SDL, that doesn't necessarily mean it, it feeds up the food chain. Secondly, when you license components as a vendor, that doesn't guarantee you source code access. Um, it doesn't guarantee you private symbols even. So the reason this tool came about was because of work I did in a former life where to assure uh, or gain visibility of the components that we were licensing that were they leveraging the available compiler defenses or were they uh, a level that was acceptable in kind of parallel to the, our own internal assurance effort. Um, obviously you can, um, you want to, as part of any SDL, make sure that you're using the free features. You know, an SDL in reality will take decades for any company with any sizable code base to adopt and really kind of bear fruit. If you set that out as your goal, and you don't focus on getting the very easy, by comparison, and, and free things right out, out of the gate, then you're likely going to fail in the end. Um, and then also, what we feel that's important is to drive SDL adoption and for vendors to take security more seriously is empowering end user organizations to be able to assess the products that they are buying and literally ask the hard questions of their vendors and literally saying like, why are you not leveraging this feature? Why have you not kind of adopted or, or shown kind of uh, security awareness in your own product development? And we feel that, that that's basically gonna um, help drive adoption of these features across all vendors. And then there's obviously the, the there is a, a consequence of that as well by, uh, by able to identify threats or lack of mitigation adoption by vendors, then you can look to deploy in the short term, internal mitigations by leveraging technologies such as EMET. So that's the Microsoft uh, Enhanced Mitigation Experience Toolkit, which allows you to effectively band-aid on certain OS mitigations or, or compiler mitigations where they haven't been natu natively applied. Um, so I think, I think I've covered most of these here. Um, but I think that the key one, it, the, the key one is the top one here, that a vendor's SDL is simply not enough today. You know, you may trust Adobe and, and see all the positive changes. You may trust Microsoft as you see all the positive changes. But literally, if you want to understand the food chain of components, that is also extremely valuable. Um, and if nothing else, from, a, from an, a, an offensive perspective, um, it can be very useful as well because you're likely to target the component which has the least resources available to adopt an SDL. Um, so when we start looking at why people want to identify and, and do today um, the, the missing features or the missing mitigations is that mitigations today are expensive and difficult to bypass. If you run into and try and exploit a vulnerability you know, against an ASLR, DEP enabled, stack cookie enabled binary for whatever reason it's likely your, your investment required to exploit that is going to go up significantly because you're going to have to find other vulnerabilities such as information leakage issues or similar. So if researchers are researchers that are looking to maximize their return on investment, um, th this is why it's a, a key kind of driver for them. Uh, and this is really a great example. So I guess this came out last year, this bug. So in IIS, um, it was reported, on, I think, on full disclosure initially, reported as an FTP denial of service, actually turned out it was um, memory corruption. Uh, Chris and Ryan spent months, effectively, uh, researching it. They did some awesome work and achieved kind of control of EIP. ASLR thwarted actual exploitation. So they had gone through all of it, got the com completely kind of controllable memory corruption, achieved uh, overwrite and, and program control effectively, but just simply couldn't locate their payload. Um, so if you want to avoid these types of, you know, this was a lovely academic exercise and I think it was very valuable, um, but if your goal is to actually produce a Metasploit module or whatever, 
these are the types of uh, events that you do want to avoid. Um, so when we, what we're now going to look at is go through um, each of the mitigations which are available. And if you want to build a tool or write a script or whatever, um, show you basically what you check for and, and the different methodologies for checking for them. Um, we're then going to cover some of the existing tool sets which were, are available today, um, how they approach this problem and their dependencies, and then show you how we kind of dealt with the issue as well. Um, so the compiler linker version, uh, the linker version is stamped into the P header of the Windows binary, so that's easy enough. The more interesting one is the rich header, which is, exists in all Microsoft Visual C compiled binaries. So at the top of the Windows binary, there is basically an XOR encoded payload, which lists um, all version numbers of all of the compilers used to produce all of the objects which end up in the resultant executable or DLL, um, which is obviously I I extremely useful. And this was, you know, this has been public knowledge since 2004, and it was further documented documented in 2008, but you know, it's a rich source of information. However, these version numbers aren't logical. It doesn't tell you it's like Visual Studio 2010 or, or Visual Studio 2005 SP1. You basically get a lot of numbers which don't mean anything. Um, so this is some, you know, some code porn, basically. This is how you would go through in .NET and, and kind of un-XOR the value. So there's a known magic if you actually kind of get the X or correct. So every binary, that it's important to note, every binary has in itself a unique key, which you need value, sorry, not a key, that you need to extract and use that to unX all the payload with. <coughs> um, so we went through uh, a version mapping, mapping exercise in our kind of, in a small subset of the UK information security community. And we literally got everyone that had a copy of Visual Studio on every rusty, MSDN disk and literally mapped through all versions of Visual Studio, all service packs, both x86 and ARM, um, uh, to kind of do that version mapping to a version correlation. And, and the reason is simply to allow us to now identify where, for example, Visual Studio 2003 was used, its stack cookie implementation was weaker than the Visual Studio 2005 version, for example. So it kind of gives us that level of granularity in identifying the particular compilers um, that are used. So the way that Microsoft addresses this or does this with Binscope, which I will cover in some depth later, is they actually use private symbols, which actually has encoded in it the version of Visual Studio um, used for all of the objects, or the Visual C compiler at least. Um, so address space layer randomization, so jumping the program around in memory is stumped in the P header, so it's very trivial to identify. Um, you, can do, you can see this in dump bin, so those of you that have used Visual Studio, if you do dump bin slash all, it will dump the DLL characteristics field, um, and they actually have now friendly name conversion, so that it will explain if ASLR, uh, and then DEP also. And actually, this is an interesting point, that, which I only learned this morning, um, because we, we noticed on EMAT, on the 64-bit DLL that's used by Microsoft, that that binary doesn't actually um, have in its DLL characteristics that it opts into NX. So we uh, had a chat with some people in the Microsoft Science team, and they said, yeah, good call, we'll get it fixed, but it actually doesn't matter. In, uh, indiscriminate of whether or not the DLL or binary says it uses NX, all 64-bit processes get NX by default, uh, and there's no way, effectively, to uh, opt out. So it's useful to know, but primarily it's for 32-bit processes you're interested in. Um, so stack cookies is an interesting one. So there is a field in the executable header, which is this, this security cookie, and you don't see it set a lot, um, which can lead to potentially a lot of false positives or false negatives, depending on on how you want to phrase it. So the, the approach that we took, um, we looked for this um, for non, uh, for debug builds, we looked for this particular uh, function import, which says whether or not, because um, when a, a stack cookie violation occurs, it will call this function. The other way that's more reliable and that we use everywhere else is we literally use a heuristic. So what we've effectively done is taken the IDA approach. So the way that IDA um, identifies common functions from C runtimes 
is it takes the uh, assembly and basically removes the variables, so the, the memory addresses or whatever else. And we've come up with a number of heuristics for like the function prologues, the epilogues, and certain common functions related to stack cookies. The benefit of taking this approach is it allows us to do versioning. So again, Microsoft over um, a number of releases have either changed how the prolog works or what it looks like, say, uh, or common functions. So we can identify in a binary, we can say, well, not only was it compiled with Visual Studio 2003, 2005, 2008, but it has only cookies for 2005 and 2008. So it kind of uh, provides a very granular and, and kind of deep level view um, without the need for any source or actual um, significant disassembly, which makes it fast and, and the false positive rate. Well, we don't actually notice we, many. The biggest problem we did have was false negatives, which we've got on top of now. Um, so safe structured exception handling, for those that aren't familiar, um, when an exception occurs on Windows, um, there you, you could effectively, if you overwrote the uh, SCH uh, on the stack, you could jump to wherever you wanted to. So to mitigate this, uh, Microsoft had introduced basically a registered set of callers or parts of code. 32-bit um, processes only, um, but again, it's enumer you can enumerate uh, the adoption of this via the PE header. So it's a relatively easy check for us to, 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 to um, enumerate. Uh, and then this is an interesting one. So this was the first bug of the year from Microsoft, and it was to do with the low configuration directory size and related to safe SEH. Um, there was a bug in the Windows loader where it would check if um, the size was specifically 64 in the loader configuration directory, and if it wasn't, it would say it wasn't safe SCH compatible. Um, the problem was is that the actual Microsoft Visual C runtime for Visual Studio 2003 RTM had a different size to that, so any binary that used was compiled with Visual Studio 2003 RTM would effectively have this massive binary in memory, which could be used as a ROP payload jump point um, for uh, exploitation. So they've, although they've kind of written the patch, and because it was everything apart from Windows XPSP3 was affected, um, we still flag this because it, you know it, it's a mitigation, and now it relies on effective patching of all of the nodes. And if you know that someone hasn't got a good patch deployment model, it can be of use. And we did an audit of. So like, there's a lot not compiled with it. So like, there's big chunks of Java, uh, Putty, um, and, and numerous other things that you wouldn't expect that are all susceptible to, the, to this issue. So we flag it anyway as a, as a point of note. Um, the default process heap. So you can actually have, um, we understand the fact the value of non-executable memory generally is a mitigation. Um, you can actually have the default process heap creation flags embedded in the PE file. I've actually never seen this in production, but we flag it anyway. So we literally see how the first heap of the process is going to be created and if it's going to be marked as executable, um, because obviously that would be bad. Um, shared sections, so a section of a, of a process of a PE file could have a number of properties. And so you can see here, uh, it, it can be executable, it can be readable, it can be writable or shared. Um, any PE file section which is shared and writable means that you get this risk of one process being able to update a section that will be mirrored in another process, um, which is obviously horrendously dangerous, um, especially if you're going across users. So um, th that's it's something that needs to be mindful of and, and something that we check for. And then, as I mentioned earlier, some of the defensive APIs and, and the adoption of these outside of Microsoft and Adobe uh, is really surprisingly low from what we've seen. So heap set information, as I said, you can make this call Again, it's supported on Windows Vista, SP1, and forward, I believe, where you basically enable a heap, uh, terminate on heap corruption. So as soon as the heap uh, implementation takes any corruption, just kills the process rather than trying to struggle on. Um, opting into DEP always. So one of the common exploitation techniques was um, basically jumping as part of your first stage payload to opt the process out of DEP. By calling this API, um, you can actually force DEP on for always, which is hugely valuable in terms of frustrating exploitation. And then the last point is uh, the encode point of uh, API. So lots of developers 
um, may start kind of hoofing pointers around all over the place. And if these are long-lived pointers, you really want to start encoding. So basically, uh, encode pointer XORs them. So if someone does get, for example, a memory uh, address leak bug, so they can know where things are in memory and they're trying to target a particular pointer, they can't actually write it over it with anything sensible because they don't know the XOR key. So we usually use that as an indicator that the developers understand security and actually have done some level of um, analysis on what their exposure is. Um, and then SDL band APIs. And I, I, I'm, I almost loathe this because I've never seen, well, I rarely see binaries which are actually clean of this. There are 145 APIs. Microsoft still uses them in legacy code, right? So you can't really... Um, preach to everyone that they shouldn't be using them when there's product new still shipping with them. Um, but it does act as a good security awareness. For example, if you run and you see 35, I think is the maximum I've ever seen in one binary being used, versus three, you know, that, uh, you know, you know which binary you're more likely to focus your efforts on for further analysis. <laughs> um, and this is a point that I, I touched to earlier. So Microsoft has this banned API but they don't talk about some deficiencies in commonly used APIs. So virtual alloc um, is a commonly used API, but it doesn't benefit from ASLR. So if you use virtual alloc to allocate any memory and you provide it the, uh, the zero flag, so like give me an address, that is not randomized. So whereas you may do your normal mallocs or whatever, um, where you do get it, when you use do virtual alloc, you do not, and it's not called out on the MSDN page. So again, we identify this because if people are using virtual lock and mapping memory um, writable and executable, you're likely going to have in a fully ASLR-enabled binary chunks of memory, a known address which you can write to and which are executable, which is obviously dangerous. Um, so the way that we wanted to mitigate this is uh, we developed a virtual lock underscore s implementation. And this was inspired by what Google Chrome did. So we thought, well, oh, virtual lock, Google are using it all over the place. And they had obviously identified this problem, not documented or shared it with the community, but they had identified the problem. And they had implemented um, some attempt at randomization. We were testing their implementation, and we found out that there were certain deficiencies. So it works very well, their implementation, very early on, where you have lots of memory address, lots of virtual address space available. But as that starts to fill up, their kind of their algorithm fails in terms of the addresses it's requesting. And when it fails, it basically starts becoming linear in terms of its allocations. So the way that we address that was we, um, we alternate between bottom up and top down randomization. So if we get a failure on an attempted allocation, we then do a top down allocation and try that. And if that fails, we then start fall back to linear. But what we found is we get a far, far higher chance, even in the memory stress situations, to get a successful allocation. And so we just literally wrapped it up into a, a free BSD license, use as you wish, adopt as you care um, version. Um, and then the other thing we look for uh, extensively is uh, load library and its uses. So the gentleman from Atcross is here. So. Um, when you call uh, load library, it's very da it, the chances of, uh, and create process as well, there's a chance of DLL or process planting. But Microsoft also released a number of uh, mitigation APIs to reduce the chances of DLL planting. For those that aren't familiar with DLL planting, effectively, if you, for example, navigate to a network share and you open a file with a particular extension and the program that passes that file doesn't uh, need a particular DLL, it may then try and load dynamically that DLL to support that file format. Unfortunately, it will use that current working directory where you're calling the file from, which could be a remote network share under someone else's control. Um, so this, this is the whole DLL planting issue that we suffer. So it, again, this is something else that we check for uh, and, and flag for developers. Um, and so these are the mitigation APIs that you, that you see. Uh, there's also a registry key now, which developers and people that are doing system builds can do to mitigate DLL planting, but I will, I will cover that in a little bit because we've wrapped that up into a, a, another free project. Um, so in, in terms of detecting and enumerating the UAC and the integrity levels, uh, in the Windows binary, there's a manifest. 
file typically now. Um, and and so the information is simply there, so relatively easy to extract for us. Um, the .NET checks, um, there are three we actually do, but two of them are the strong name checks and the allow partially trusted callers. The allow partially trusted callers is primarily used where you have a browser-based .NET component, um, which will be considered partially trusted, trying to call into other assemblies. Um, so we flag whether or not that that's actually allowed. Um, and so this is a tool called ASMX, which is open source, and it's a .NET kind of um, binary investigation tool. But these are what we check, effectively the skip validation, um, whether or not unmanaged code is in there. So although it's a .NET binary, if it's compiled, for example, with the slash unsafe function, you can introduce memory corruption issues into .NET, um, which are actually exploitable, so we at least flag um, the danger of those. And again, all of this is striving to, you know, when you have a big product or many products to assess, really identifying where you want to focus your next round of analysis um, to go deeper. Um, we also recently introduced at least the ability to detect uh, Windows app containers. So those that aren't familiar, uh, in Windows 8, they're introducing a, a, a new app container, which it can be thought of as a far, um, far more constrained capabilities model for processes. And they, so they've, they've created, like Android and similar, like GPS, uh, file, network access as capabilities to processes. Um, and they're described in the program's manifest. And then they have to indicate that that binary should run with inside one of these low privileged app containers. Um, it's present in one of the, in one of the P header file, uh, uh, P fields called DLL characteristics. They've not actually documented it. Um, the way that we identified this was we looked at the Windows 8 SDK and they have an assurance tool for uh, to basically check compatibility with app, uh, app containers and you can see the new value that they check for. Um, but we did a long post basically collating um, all of the information we could find on Windows app, app, app containers. So if you are interested, I encourage you to, uh, to, to go and read it. Um, so there are some other miscellaneous bits and bobs that we spit out um, or that we document for company uh, for the user which we find useful. So one is force integrity. So what this says is Windows has this very interesting behavior which is if the digital signature of a file doesn't match, it's just treated as if it isn't signed. It doesn't actually tell you that the signature doesn't match. It just defaults to, uh, okay, it's not valid so we'll treat it as unsigned which is wonderful um, unless you're dealing with you know, certain things like crypt or whatever. So Microsoft has this ability that forces the integrity check and will literally refuse to load the file or the library if that digital signature um, doesn't match. So we, we, we at least identify, and again, the only instances I've actually seen this used is around uh, crypto libraries, both in TrueCrypt and, and Windows Core. Um, we spit out the company name, and so this allows us to, as I said, you know, in the case of Adobe Reader 10 or whatever, identify the, the vendor food chain, and then also who signs it. So you start seeing kind of other vendors or application producers signing other vendors' code, um, which raises more questions than it answers. So now I'm going to dig into some of the existing tools and and where they fall down or where they didn't cover that we wanted to. So there's a, this tool has been around since, well, about five years, or no, maybe not that quite long, four years. So it's a, a RATSEC, it's a .NET, .NET based tool, and literally scans running processes and files on the file system, and it does um, effectively uh, band, SDL API checks, um, it does NX, and it does DEP. And that's pretty much it. But it is a very kind of a very quick um, tool to use. So you know we want to recognise the work of others where we come along and stump across it. And then Microsoft, and this is the big one that, that I guess most people will be familiar with. Actually, who is familiar with Binscope here? Okay, one person. So Binscope is Microsoft's answer for kind of developers or QA people um, that have access to private debug symbols to get a base level of assurance of the binaries. So it either integrates into Visual Studio, 
or you literally just download it, run it, plonk in a, li a binary or a library, and it will literally give you a pass or fail for numerous checks. Um, but as I said, it does rely um, on private symbols. It does a lot of what we have discussed, but it also doesn't do uh, a number of others. What's interesting is with the available, and so this is where companies like Veracode can step in because they actually do proper disassembly and they do get um, symbols from their clients and at times, uh, these additional checks. So what they can look for is where stack cookies are used, making sure that they are actually initialized correctly by the process. So what we may see, for example, in our approach is that, yes, yeah, stack cookies are used around functions. We can see those in the prologues and the epilogues. But what we can't say categorically is that the cookie, which is used uh, to protect all of those functions, has actually been initialized correctly with a random number, for example, um, whereas they can actually do that. Uh, they can also check for um, coverage. So they can make sure that all of the functions that should be protected by stack cookies, i.e. they have like a character buffer of four bytes or more, are, do actually get or are actually protected. Um, and then they also can do some things around ATL version and vulnerable version checks, which we can't, um, well, reliably at least. So I, I think in short, when we do have, again, another blog post which kind of documents what they do and what we don't, it definitely adds value. And if you do have access to private symbols, like you're a product vendor, then, then this is the way to go. And especially because it allows you to push it out to your developers, to their desktop, and literally have it as part of their compilation process. Um, and then what we've um, basically produced here. So this isn't a sales pitch. We do sell it, but it's not a sales pitch. So if you want a copy of this, just email us there, and we'll quite happily send you uh, a free copy um, when I get back to the UK on the weekend. Um, but what we're going to show you is effectively how uh, we have done this. So again, this goes back to the kind of the philosophy that everything should be easy. Um, uh, pick on Adobe once more. And the Adobe person in the room will love me for it, I'm sure. Um, so, literally, we're just going to scan it very, very quickly. I and mean, again, this is, as I said, these tools aren't necessarily designed for security people uh, as the first customer, but they're useful to them. They're designed for people like QA teams and, and others, or you know, people that have other assurance activities and they're not binary experts that want green is good, red is bad. Um, so I think we're done. So as you can see here, we're, well, I won't go through the kind of the early fields, but what we can see here, for example, is the kind of the compiler versions that are used. Um, so we flag where the weaker ones are actually present in the compilation, uh, have actually been used for compilation. We check all of the um, additional flags that I've mentioned. We check for calls to the kind of security aware APIs. So, you know, has the developer indicated that they um, actually understand the deficiencies or the benefits of these types of functions? <coughs> uh, and then we start moving on to, so we can see, um, I'll try and find it, there is a, at least one, I think. Yeah, so we can see here, for example, that this library is calling load library but it actually doesn't call any of the DLL planting mitigations. So again, you may wish to focus your efforts on to there. Um, and then I think, well, we, we do the band SDL, SDL API count, but this was the, this speaks to my point earlier about a product. So I scanned Adobe Reader 10 here. So we can see that, you know, Adobe does produce, these are actually some open source components. And then we see um, IBM, Lextech, Right Hemisphere, I'd never heard of them before I looked at this. They produce a lot of 3D libraries. Um, and then RSA, and uh, I appreciate the response of this conference, so I won't insult them too badly. Um, but we can see there that they, you know, they've done really well on the defensive compiler options. Um, but, you know, so it kind of, you can see the value, basically, of making this really accessible to people to ask those types of hard questions of, of both vendors and our own internal development teams. So... Uh, so if we move beyond um, binary, so I, obviously that binaries is the topic of the talk and we are going to go back to it. Um, I want to cover off a little bit more. 
so Microsoft produces a number of mitigations which don't require you to touch the program at all. They are actually require, all they require are uh, registry modifications. So if you're doing internal system builds, you can turn these on for processes, or if you are a vendor and you know you're having to ship um, some lame duck components, I guess is the most polite way of describing it, you can opt them into um, some of these other additional checks. So for example, one is forcing um, AS, uh, yeah, ASLR on, the CW DLL, uh, illegal DLL in search is the DLL planting mitigation that I mentioned. These are all very well documented on the MSDN site. Um, and then there's a safe SCH overwrite protection, which is in addition to safe SCH, an additional integrity check um, around structured exception handling. Um, again, for those that are developers in the room and that are writing products, uh, we have again wrapped this up into a BSD licensed um, small header file, which you can include in your product, which will literally just opt these in for any executables that you want. We actually produce it as a header file and a utility. So if, again, if you're doing system builds and you want to do this in your, your system installation scripts, um, we have uh, a small tool that will just turn these on for any binary that you wish. Um, but, um, so, you know, and it speaks to some of the points, I guess, that Dan made in the keynote. Today, you know, we are trying to solve lots of things, but there are lots of things that are still needing to be solved. And so Microsoft and, and you know, the GCC folk and, and whatever have done lots of work around compiler mitigations, but we still have code constructs like this that will still get you reliable control of EIP if you use C++. You know, there, so the point I want to make with this slide is that even if you enable all of these kind of, or, or if your binaries are coming up clean against all of the checks that we've kind of identified and discussed, it doesn't mean that you're not gonna be exploitable because of deficiencies like these today. You know, the, the way that these can be solved is relatively easy, but we're just waiting for the compiler um, suppliers to actually adopt. So what, what occurs here is, is because there is a, there's a virtual function in this, um, we can effectively trample the V table of one of the C++ classes, and then when the function, uh, when the class is deconstructed, uh, I think we call it on the deconstructor, oh no, we call a function called print buffer, um, we effectively uh, gain control of the process. So it's just something to bear in mind. And I wanted to also um, touch on something else, not Windows, because obviously, you know, I appreciate that there is a world outside of Microsoft as operating systems. Um, so if you work with ELF files, so if you're a big Linux shop or similar, um, again, GCC has a number of defensive compiler options which aren't necessarily used always for libraries or whatever else. And there is this excellent um, checksec dot, it's actually dot sh, not dot h, uh, from trapkit.de, which will audit uh, compiled ELF files uh, in a similar way and flag those that don't um, have appropriate mitigations. And again, it's kind of, especially if you're using closed source products on those platforms, is encouraging your supplier, your vendors to actually adopt these. Um, and I wanted to touch on the run path, our path stuff. So um, my previous employer, <laughs> this was identified, and we were big users of CheckSec, and so we contributed back this check. So there's the DLL planting problem on Windows, which I discussed. Um, in ELF files, there is a section um, so, who is a Unixy person here? Okay, three-ish. Okay, so uh, for the Windows people, um, they're in the ELF file, do you have like your your, your uh, environment variable which says where your shared libraries are? Um, actually, in the uh, ELF file itself, it can have a hard-coded path as well, and that hard-coded path doesn't have to exist. So, if the developer, in their wisdom, has either left somewhere um, that you can create. Uh, and or you know pointed it to slash temp in some testing wisdom um, and you can put the a shared library there that you want you can effectively hijack a process um, so we contributed this check back um, and I got told by someone recently that Ubuntu apparently did a massive check-in which resolved lots of instances of this so uh, there is some win there uh, okay so um, in conclusions, all I guess what I wanted to cover was there's a lot of information in the binaries. Um, 
This, these tools are basically are all designed to basically raise that minimum bar in terms of gaining a level of assurance, being able to assess it without being experts and having to reverse engineer or sit with dump bin. Um, and really, if you are on the attack side, which obviously none of you will be, um, it does help with target identification to make sure that you do actually win Pwn to Own next year um, and all without the use of symbols. Um, so that's it. Thank you. That's the... Uh, if you don't mind contributing some feedback, obviously it will help us improve. So any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, good question. Yeah, so stack cookies uh, apply to kernel mode drivers, um, and that's the only one that I can think of, actually, stack cookies specifically will apply. Because the, 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 way, the way the page pooling works is like they don't have terminate on heap corruption and, and, and those types of things. Ah, thank you. Yes, sir. So um, when you're in a commercial, I can only talk about examples. So in a, if you're in a commercial relationship, you've licensed a DLL, uh, it's when you start, can you please enable this feature because we've licensed it for it, they go, do you realize how much work that's going to be? And, and basically they create the kind of the testing sob story and the compatibility sob story rather than actually trying it and actually just seeing if it works. So that's, it, it's kind of fear really that, you know, by turning, and that is fair, like if you turn on stack cookies and you've never used them before, your product will likely crash because there will be stack corruption occurring which has never actually kind of been seen in the field, but then suddenly when you do turn on stack integrity checks, you start seeing it fall all over the place. So it's anxiety about extra work, I think, is the, uh, is the correct phrase. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. If you have any questions, those are our details.